For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. That's 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 1. Oh, for as much then as Christ hath suffered, he suffered like passions as we. He suffered. He was a real man. Flesh, blood, bones and sinew. The very thing that the church of Imperial Rome claims to do by its wafer. It's starch wafer. Hmm? Does the wafer suffer? No. Nope. Does the man upholding it declare himself to be a blasphemer? Yes. What kind of conscience, what kind of man can actually declare that he is holding his maker in his hands? Only a devil can do that. Could you do it? Could I do it? Could a normal person in the street do it? Of course not. Christ have suffered for us. The NIV and the rest take out us. Mm, for us. Making it personal. Because of these translations of man and of the word of man quite naturally because they're not inspired of God are universal salvation doctrine which makes the gospel impersonal God impersonal Jesus Christ and the Holy Ghost impersonal and if you go to the holiness movement, you can gather that again. If you go to the holiness movement, or the second blessing movement, Tongues movement, the Trinity is separated from us. That's what they're preaching. We're in their universal salvation heresy. They're separated. We must take hold of them. We must take hold of the Trinity. And if we want to be on fire, hmm? Not to speak in tongues as, as having received the Holy Spirit. You see, it's always external. And it's always emotions. It's exactly what the world does because they are of the world. All these organisations are of the world. When we were picked upon by God, and we were picked upon, oh, huh? when Jehovah picked upon us, he made us complete in Christ Jesus. And the enemy doesn't like it. It doesn't like it. And it does not like our personal relationship with the very one who picked upon us. He picked us to be his children. We didn't. He picked us. He picked us in eternity. In his own understanding, he chose us and placed us in that heavenly metaphorical book of life to be read out in eternity that these children belong to me. Me, I have chosen them. They have not chosen me. They did not know of their existence in eternity. Only lively thoughts we were. We weren't angels. Oh, someone, the enemy will say, some of the enemy will say, Oh, you were angels. No, we're not. We were lively thoughts. In the mind of an ever-present God. 
an invincible, ever-present God, present with himself. Self-contained, beyond all that we could ever begin to imagine. We can't even begin to ascertain anything, anything of God. What we know of God is given to us of God. Everything. And the more we read and mull over Scripture and come to the understanding of Scripture, a little bit more is added. In the ocean of understanding. A mighty ocean. A drop in a bucket. <laughs> oh, there are those that strut about this world, you know, and they get on the world stages. And um, they're the great ones. God is not interested in these dogs and goats and wolves and foxes, whited sepulchres, not interested. They're not interested in the billy goats of this world, D.L. Moody's of this world, the Spurgeon of this world, the Jason's world. He's not interested. The haughty, godless, nominal side of Christianity God is wiped off the chalkboard of time. Doesn't care to bless those people. The only blessing that God ever gives to any is for the good that they do. If you give a cup of water to somebody, you'll be blessed. The person who walks by and doesn't will be cursed even further than they are because God will add a curse upon a curse and upon a curse until that person at a period of, of his life will regret ever being born. And for those who say that God is, is not intervening in this world, that is quite correct in that sense of what they say. Because he does more than intervene. He controls the world. He sustains the world. He gives you breath every second of the day which you take for granted. And those who say that the devil is in charge of this world are worshippers of Satan. The devil himself. And they point to us Christians and say, look at it and all the sin and wickedness. It must be therefore that the devil is in charge. So... Whom are they giving glory to? Whom are they giving ultimate power to? Eh? Who, who are they saying is omnipresent? Omniscient? Hmm? All powerful. God almighty to them is Satan. Satan to them. And that the Trinity of God therefore is beneath the throne of Satan. And what was it that Satan said, Lucifer, son of the morning, in the beginning, and probably in the beginning of creation? He saw creation, wanted the rule of creation, always wanted the rule of creation. He couldn't want any other rule. He's standing there in eternity. What came along? To inspire him to move from his position. It wasn't eternity. Because eternity is eternity. There's no time in eternity. There's no change in eternity. So there could be no change in him. And his followers. So something came along. And that something was creation. Clearly. And ever since then. Tin pot dictators wanted to take the world. Because they're full of Satan. Satan wants to rule this world. But he can't. He can titularly rule it by wicked men and women. 
British governments, American governments, you name the governments. Hmm? But overall, he's the servant of the Most High God. Jesus Christ. Within whom is the fullness of the Godhead bodily, says Paul to the Colossians, reminding them who it is that is the sovereign, who it is that rules and reigns, and that out of Jerusalem that is above. The church, Jerusalem, one and the same thing. Zion, Mount Zion, he sits upon, one and the same thing. He rules over all and is blessed forever. He has all power and authority given unto him as the glorified man of God, the Son of God. The only begotten Son of God in the beginning by inspiration. By inspiration. And no matter what comes upon this world, it is all of God. And he doeth whatever he pleaseth in the circuit of heaven. And there's none that can stay his hand, nor say unto thee, What doest thou? Unto him, What doest thou? Who art thou, O man, that repliest against God? What is the purpose? What is the purpose? But of course man is alienated from God by original sin. And original sin is what the Arminian neo-evangelicals and the pseudo-Protestants have cast to one side and said, look at the world, it's reigning by the devil. This world is fallen. You have done away with the fall, original sin. The world is made up of sinners. Sinners. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And God is angry with the wicked every day. And the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness and ungodliness of men. It's not against goodness, it's against all unrighteousness and ungodliness of men that hold the truth in unrighteousness. And God will come a second time in Jesus Christ the Lord and he will finish this world. He will come in flaming fire from out of God. He will dispose of all things. This world is reserved unto fire. So, what kind of persons should we be? Godly in all manner of conversation. Godly in our lives. Godly. Not tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. We should know what we believe and believe what we know. Christ died for us. Specific people. Peter carries on. Hmm? Died for us in the flesh. Arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. We're dead to the sin. We're fighting sin. Hmm? As good soldiers of Jesus Christ, first beginning with ourselves and then this world, so that we are in a right position to contend with this world. This world is in sin. And those who abide with their sinful lives and feed their sinful lives will contend against other sinners. And it's just chaos and confusion and every evil way. We should be steadfast. Deal with our lives and deal with the wickedness that we face in this world. We should be quiet when we come to this world. We should be quiet. We should just move through. We should be the last ones in this world to speak. We shouldn't be swift to speak. When we move through the world, 
We are instructed to be slow to speak. But when we speak, we should speak precisely and to the point. And rebuke or to instruct whatever the situation calls for. People start shouting and bawling at us. So what? Sticks and stones will break my bones, but names will never hurt me. Hmm? Slow to speak. Slow to anger. But once engaged, we should be the persons who speak upright and we should not be afraid of man what man can do we should basically in this day and age seek to go back to Christianity of the Reformation age and of the Puritan age that fed from the scriptural age, the apostolic age, the Old Testament age. We have lost it today. There is a device in the corner, corner of virtually every house. Thankfully, there was some mindful of what that device conveys. That idiot's lantern, that devil's vision, the television. And people are away with it. That device conveys, and we are precise with our words with this, because there will be some that say it's just an inanimate object. They know very well that we're not talking about the inanimate object, but what is conveyed through that inanimate object. They try to defend themselves. For having one of these demonic devices. If you want to know the news, just go out into the world. And at the end of the day, if you want to be deceived, get yourself a te television. That'll do it for you. You'll have the mind of the world, but not the mind of Christ. And whatever that TV tells you, that, that devil's vision, that one-eyed monster, you will believe. And so Christianity as a whole has collapsed as a profession, as a way of life, as a walk. Do you know, ladies and gentlemen, you can go into what is termed the house of God today and the minister so-called behind the pulpit We'll go on about this present virus, okay, that the government call Corona. All right, now this is April the 8th, 2020. I'm talking about this upon. It's been with us for some weeks now, and it shall be with us for some other weeks. Now the ministers will say, oh, this is a, this is a plague, this is sent of God, this blah, 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 blah. They believe it. They believe a lie. Because it's a lie. And there are many persons, even the ungodly, that are waking up and seeing that this is a lie. An utter lie. We won't go into... The, the story of how we came to be imposed upon as a nation and the world itself. But it is a lie. We'll only say this. It's retribution from the British government for our beating the government. Okay. Over... Leaving hmm, Chedaloma's government. 
Hey, be you. <laughs> Which we never joined, but that's again another story. Okay. It's retaliation. Retaliation like the poll tax. We had immigration that followed on to attack us from the British government. And other governments followed, okay? But the problem is, you go into these meeting houses and the minister will challenge you. He will shout and bawl at you. And you will be anathematised for telling the truth that it doesn't exist. And they will go home to the TV and they will be continuously brainwashed by this monster in the corner to oppose us Christians if they be themselves Christians it's doubtful these days very doubtful the way nominal Christianity is being churned out in these gospel campaigns hmm? they don't see it themselves they don't see it themselves and for this reason because the people don't want the truth. Anybody who speaks the truth is anathematized, hated. The eyes glow. God sends them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie. And how strong is that lie? Hmm? Sad because it continues on that they may be damned. Damned indeed. Who believe not the truth. Hmm? But had pleasure in unrighteousness. Truth. What do you mean truth? Truth. Not a specific truth. 